So one of the things that I'm seeing in this conversation and also that I wanted to talk about going into the room mm -hmm. um, is this idea of balancing the, to say it a certain kind of way, the, the right amount of self-criticism. So right. I had behaviors as a kid mm -hmm. that were adaptive, to use the term of psychology, mm -hmm. where there was a circumstance that was present around me yeah. and I developed these behaviors in response. Yeah, Some of them were positively adaptive or useful traits, but others were quote unquote maladaptive traits. They were negative responses essentially to the circumstances that I found myself in. And as my situation changed, the maladaptive traits stayed because that's how psychology tends to work. What we learn tends to stay with us. Yeah, absolutely. And it sticks to the wallpaper of the mind and becomes the surroundings that you carry with yourself from environment to environment. So. When I was a kid in school, the way that I felt fulfilled fundamentally, or I felt, you know, quote unquote, of value to maybe put it a different kind of way, was by demonstrating that I was smart. That was what I knew. I knew I was a quote unquote smart kid. I did pretty well in classes. I talked a lot in class. I did the whole thing. Often to uh, my own detriment and the detriment of the people around me because I would talk a lot and they wouldn't get to say anything. And I would kind of go out of my way to kind of twist the knife with kids sometimes and the whole thing. As I aged out of these problematic environments, I still retained these problematic behaviors that then went on to cause me problems in other social environments. So I was kind of perpetuating my own cycle. So the question then, I guess operationally, is how do you balance clearly viewing yourself and going, okay, something happened to me as a kid. I developed this maladaptive behavior and now it would benefit me to adjust and work on this behavior, but without becoming excessively self-flagellating about it. Because that's also something that I've, I definitely, I mean, certainly earlier in my life and still to this day, struggle with to a certain extent. One thing that's very important is to be able to observe it almost impersonally, or to put it in the frame of, it's called sometimes, common humanity. Mm. It was normal, of course. When you think about the causes and conditions that were stacked up, uh, it's amazing that you're just not a total neurotic puddle on the floor. In a certain sense, of course, as a bright, deeply fair seven-year-old or nine-year-old, you would act those ways. There's a kind of a, of course about it. Or let's say you grow up in a home where there's a lot of anger flying around and you just learn to get off the battlefield, get off the radar. Of course, there would be a tendency to sort of shrink away from conflict or to be afraid of sticking your, your head up because you might get it taken off. Of course, that would be the case. Mm. That's part one, I think, normalizing it, accepting it, and then also bringing compassion to it because in those ways of being that we acquire is a, an, an implicit suffering. There is pain in it. Um, I did kind of similar things. I wasn't so outspoken. I was less extroverted than you are. I was shyer. And that kind of added up over time. Increasingly, it's very painful self-consciousness. So I didn't say very much. But I felt very left out, very mm. withdrawn. It wasn't like a tranquil uh, quietude, which now I'm very familiar with and enjoy thoroughly. But it was a painful withdrawal. Mm. So, you know, I relate to that too. In, and in that was pain. So in your MO of knowing or being the knower, let's say, there might have been an implicit subtle fear that if you're not the knower, what might happen? Or uh, if you didn't know everything, what might happen? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, Or if that MO was stripped away from you, mm -hmm. that armor or mask was stripped away from you, uh, you'd be just sort of hanging out, you know, bare ass naked mm -hmm. in the winds of life. Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay. Another is to be rational about it. Mm -hmm. There's no replacement for seeing what you see and claiming what you know for yourself. It really served me to realize that my way of being was costing me. It was driving people away. Uh, if they weren't doing it to me, I was doing it. And I wanted to make a change. It's kind of one of these major wake-ups when you really get, you know, yep, it ain't working anymore. You just kind of take a look. Well, it does have benefits. And I need to face the price. Mm. And I need to explore a better way. That fundamental process, those three moves, acknowledging the benefits, 
appreciating the function that you know that way of being serves, but also recognizing the price, the price you're paying, and the price for others, the price for them too. And then starting to move into a different way of being. That's the fundamental process. And then you just cultivate it over time with repetition. You try this new way. It works kind of. It's sort of ragged. Try it again. You're a little better at it. Try it again. It becomes increasingly natural. And try it again times 100. It starts becoming more and more your home base. Mm 